Back when I was in college, one day in a cinema studies class, my professor casually dropped this line that blew all our minds. He said, every movie is about something, except for Ghostbusters. It's perfect, but it's not about anything. So a murmur passed through the room as we're all like, wait, is Ghostbusters really about nothing? Now this question has haunted me for years, and today I'm finally gonna get to the bottom of it as we find out what Ghostbusters is actually about, if anything. Let's quickly define some terminology. When I say a movie is about something, I'm not talking about the plot. Obviously, Ghostbusters is about guys who bust ghosts. I'm talking about theme, subtext, what is the movie saying, what's the main idea, the message. Because like my professor said, every movie has one. Even a truly terrible movie like The Room, which is about how the world is unfair and can destroy even the best of people. To figure out what a movie is about, it's best to go to the end. In the words of film crit Hulk, the ending is the conceit. In other words, a movie's conclusion is where it states what it's really about. This is where you'll find what screenwriting teacher Robert McKee calls the controlling idea, the subtextual concept that defines the whole film. And this is generally a product of a central character completing their arc by making a choice that concludes the primary conflict. But here's the thing. None of the characters in Ghostbusters has an arc. All three of the main Ghostbusters, Peter, Ray, and Egon, are exactly the same people at the beginning and end of the movie. They don't grow or change, and whatever events shaped them into people driven to pursue ghostbusting happened before the movie's story begins. Dana changes in the sense that she finds Peter annoying, then grows to like him. But that's not really an arc. And as for the primary conflict, there really isn't one. Gozer might be the main threat, but he only has a couple minutes of screen time. He isn't really a character, let alone an antagonist. What's interesting is that there are several places where you can see how some sort of theme or meaning or character arc could be added. In the climactic scene, Egon proposes they break the rule he established earlier in the movie. Don't cross the streams. They take a risk, cross the streams, and succeed. So if the writers had wanted, this could have been connected to Egon's growth over the course of the movie. He could have begun as a risk-averse person who always played by the rules, then came to realize that sometimes, to do something really great, you have to take a chance. But that's not what the movie is about. And that's not the point of Egon. This is Winston Zedmore. He's here about the job. Then there's Winston. A more traditional narrative would have made Winston Zedmore the focal point character. As he enters the world, learns about it, and changes. Maybe beginning as a non-believer, someone with a strong religious faith. I love Jesus' style, you know who comes to believe in ghosts and value the power of science. But that's not how the story goes. In the actual movie, Winston enters about halfway through, readily jumps on board with what they're doing, If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. and remains the same person to the end. Peter Venkman probably presents the clearest opportunity for subtext. He's the only character with personal stakes in the story, since Dana Barrett, his love interest, lives in the Gozer-possessed building and becomes possessed by Zool. He's the most flawed character. He uses science as a ploy to score chicks, and overall, he's kind of an asshole. So maybe he would start the movie like that, dismissing his friend's belief that using science to catch ghosts can benefit humanity. But then, because of what happens to Dana, he gets involved in the case, growing as a person and committing to the virtuous pursuit of science. But again, that's not what happens. Peter starts as a lovable jerk who gets dragged into ghostbusting by his friends, and that's where he finishes. Still the same guy, doing the same thing. He might not care as much as Ray or Egon, but he still goes along with their plan. Since no subtext comes from the character arcs, what else can we take from the ending? By taking risks, ancient evil will be defeated? By destroying the symbols of our childhood, the world can be saved? These don't really hold any water, and what makes it tough to pull real subtext from this is that there are no personal stakes for any of the Ghostbusters, beyond the world blowing up. Sure, Peter's love interest was transformed into one of Gozer's minions, but that doesn't impact any of his choices. Ray accidentally determines the form Gozer takes, but that doesn't really change anything. It's not like it takes the form of his father and then he has to get past personal issues in order to save the world. And that would be a terrible idea, so it's good that's not what happened. So there doesn't seem to be any theme or core idea we can take from the ending. But what about the rest of the movie? I polled a bunch of people, asking them what they think the theme of Ghostbusters might be, and I got a bunch of responses, so I want to go through these and see if any could potentially be a central idea. 
There's a lot of mention of the words belief or believe, but from the opening scene, there's no question as to whether ghosts exist. Pretty much everyone comes to believe in ghosts right away, except for Walter Peck, but he's so clearly wrong about everything that it doesn't really pose a genuine objection. This idea seems a bit stronger, that the film might be saying something about how society views class and skilled laborers. The story is essentially about men leaving academia and finding success as blue-collar workers. I think there are pieces of this idea in the movie, but they're not fully formed. Most importantly, none of this connects to the ending or the main conflict. Gozer has nothing to do with class, and when they do finally triumph, it's due to advanced science closer to their academic pursuits than their blue-collar lives. So this is close, but not quite. Early on in the story, when the Dean kicks them out of Columbia, he gives a speech about how science is for the betterment of mankind. We believe that the purpose of science is to serve mankind. You, however, seem to regard science as some kind of dodge or hustle. So in a different movie, this could be setting up a redemption arc, except here, the Dean is wrong. Not about Peter, he does view it as a hustle, but Ray and Egon are using science to help humanity. So again, there's no arc or theme. This movie, being a product of the 1980s, has a general anti-regulation stance, where the EPA, just doing their job, are shown to be bad guys. But you can't tell me that's what the movie is actually about. The classic theme of 80s comedies, where a group of working-class weirdos triumph over rich jerks. There are hints of this, with stuck-up guys like the Dean, Walter Peck, or even the hotel manager, but these people are obstacles, not real antagonists. The story isn't about the Ghostbusters beating them. And anyway, the Ghostbusters are academics, they have doctorates, so they're not really slobs. This one is probably the closest to a genuine core idea. Ghostbusters is essentially the story of using science to defeat the negative products of religion, destroying an actual god. But while the movie is very much pro-science, it's not exactly anti-religion. For one thing, in this story, the elements of religious faith, gods, actually exist. And Christianity is portrayed positively. Nobody steps on a church in my town! So in the world of Ghostbusters, there exists both good and bad religion. And science exists alongside it, stepping in when the effects of bad religion get out of control. So is this really a story about science versus religion? I don't think so. These are all shreds of ideas, but that's inevitable. Any movie that tells a story over about two hours is going to have something to extract. But I don't think any of these can be considered what the movie is about. Because I honestly don't think Ghostbusters is about anything. And here's a larger question. Is that a problem? Ghostbusters is one of the most popular, beloved comedies of all time. It's one of my favorite movies. And what I think is remarkable is that it works so well despite containing what would usually be considered major, debilitating flaws. This isn't an art film with an unconventional, difficult narrative structure. It's a classic three-act story. So the fact that none of the characters grow or change should be a problem. But it's not. The characters might not grow over the course of the story, but they all arrive fully formed, shaped by events that happened before the movie starts. This reminds me of the time you tried to drill a hole through your head. You remember that? That would have worked if you hadn't stopped no. me. They each have a distinct personality, perfectly calibrated to bounce off each other. Interestingly, Ghostbusters 2 does have most of these things. That movie is built around the theme that people need to be good to one another. It takes literal form in a river of slime that feeds on negativity, and the climax features the Ghostbusters harnessing positive feelings to defeat the evil villain. And also, that movie isn't nearly as good as the first. I'm not saying a lack of theme is in any way better, but that against all odds, Ghostbusters turns it into an advantage. There probably is another movie out there about nothing, but I don't think there's one as universally loved and acclaimed as Ghostbusters. But maybe you disagree. Maybe you think Ghostbusters really is about something, and that I've got it all wrong. So tell me, what do you think Ghostbusters is about? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. As you can tell, this video has literally been years in the making. And I would also like to thank our sponsor for today, which is Squarespace. 
if you want to make a website, because look, we all need websites, but you don't want to hire someone to make it, and you don't know anything about web design yourself, but you still would like it to look cool, then Squarespace is the obvious choice. They have award-winning designer templates, so it'll look really, really nice. The whole process is intuitive and very, very simple. Picking a domain name is super easy. It's nothing to install or update, no annoying stuff like that. And there's 24-hour customer service. Take it from me. I have been a customer myself for years. And if you want 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com slash Patrick, my name. There's a link in the description. You can click that. Now, if you'd like to help us make these videos, check out the Patreon. If you want to yell at me about stuff or get updates on what we're working on, then follow me on all the social media links, and I will see you next Wednesday.